Rejoice, everyone. I sail upon the sea. We're back with another Sucky Reacts to Fate. We're back with more Boats. Boat. Boat. You know, when this servant first came up in campaign, I told you that you had the name of the ship wrong, and then you told me that's not true, and then we went down a 15-minute rabbit hole in which we confirmed that I was, in fact, correct, and you had spelled the name wrong. Oh, I turned that up way too far. Yes, you did. Okay. That's much better. All right. That's much better. Anyway, so I was, in fact, correct. And I gloated on that for all of 15 minutes before you threw us into a fight that we almost lost. Yes. <laughs> and I assume it was in retaliation. It might have been. It's been a long time since we ran that chapter. Because that was Oceania. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, Oceania. So, um, because of Vorn's reaction, I do know that Francis Drake is a woman in fate. Just... You know, putting that out there. Well, I made that rather clear during the campaign itself. So. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> that that fact will not be uh, new to me, but I know very little else about her. Um, does not mean I do not know anything about him. So, Sir Francis Drake, an English explorer and better known as a privateer in the service of Queen Elizabeth I. Lived from about 1540 to 1596, so he died around age 56 um, in Panama, interestingly enough. And he was also called El Drac, or the Dragon, which uh, Sir Francis Drake, Drake, Dracon, Dragon, it makes sense. It's not that far of a stretch. Uh, he did complete the first English circumnavigation of the globe and the third overall which is pretty impressive. Um, so uh, Drake's interesting because privateering is sort of an interesting thing that happened, especially in the 15 and 1600s, because in the 15 and 1600s, sea seafaring exploration is getting really, really big, right? And so people are moving all around the globe. And one of the things that people who are loyal to certain kings and queens are doing is looting the shit of other people loyal to different kings and queens. Government subsidized right? piracy. Exactly. That is what privateering is. Basically, you get a little piece of paper that says, you are allowed to be a pirate so long as you do not target boats that belong to me. So if I'm Queen Elizabeth, you can target boats belonging to every other king in Europe except for me. And I will consider that legal. We won't hang you for it. Exactly. So this is letters of mark, they were called. Um, and they make up a, if you, if you, in a lot of modern media, they make up like a big point in a lot of like pirate, uh, like TV shows and movies and books and all that sort of stuff. Because let, a letter of mark was basically a free pardon for anything that you had ever done, right? Because you were excused from anything you did to any other monarchs vessels and obviously the monarch issuing it was okay with you so it basically meant that for the one country of the monarch issuing it you were absolved of all crimes and you were considered a-okay to go about your business and continue raiding pillaging and burning so letters of mark are fun <laughs> so sir francis drake not sir at the time but just francis drake when he was young he was born in devon uh, we don't have a formal birth date for him, but a naval historian named Corbett, who was writing an account of someone else, wrote that he was born when the six articles of 1539 were still in force and effective, which would give us a hint as to the clue of the date of his birth, puts it about 1540, because the, article, the six articles of 1539 were not valid for an incredibly long amount of time, I believe. They were repealed in 1547, which meant that according to this account, he had to be born between June of 1539 and 1547, right? So it's a pretty narrow range, which means he essentially would have been in his 40s or 50s when he died. Of course, they're putting his age on the, uh, the, the lower, on the higher end, because I think that, and that's related to all the things he did later in life, he would have had to be a certain age by a certain time. It makes sense. People are able to calculate this decently well so he was the eldest of 12 sons <laughs> that's a lot of kids his poor poor mother married to a protestant farmer and apparently his godfather was the second earl of bedford 
So he has noble connections. Uh, the Drake family did have to flee Devon to Kent during the uh, religious persecution and the rebellion in 1549. And there Drake's father would obtain an appointment to be a minister and an ordained deacon to the men in the king's navy and was essentially made vicar of a church in on the Medway at this point. So at this point, his father already has connections with the sea. So when he was young, he was given into the household of the captain William Hawkins to begin seagoing training as an apprentice. By the time he had reached the age of 18, according to the English chronicler Edmund Howes, he was already the purser for the ship. And by the 1550s, Drake's father managed to find him a position on a small bark that was a trader that traveled between Medway River and the Dutch coast, upon which he would have been able to engage in commerce um, across England, the Low Countries, and France. It's said that the ship's master at the time really was satisfied with the conduct of a young Drake, and because he died unmarried and childless, he had bequeathed the bark to Drake at this point in his life. So Drake was, by, by his 20s at the earliest, already a ship's captain because of his exemplary training and actions. In the 1560s, there were, the West African slave trade was flourishing, but it was primarily dominated by the Portuguese and the Spanish. And Sir John Hawkins, the man who raised Drake, wanted to break into that trade with the aid of colleagues and family financing his first slave voyage. Drake was not technically a part of the group that financed him, though his presence was noted as being on the slaving voyages and has been just assumed to be the case. So likely he was serving as a seaman on these voyages, and there's pretty good evidence of the last of him being on the last two voyages of the four made by this particular ship called Jesus of Lübeck, made by this Sir John Hawkins. So in the 1562, Hawkins would sail to seize Portuguese slave ships off the coast of Sierra Leone and would then turn to sell in the Spanish Indies with his cargo of slaves. It was so profitable that he gained Queen Elizabeth's support for his second voyage. She gave him one of her ships, the Jesus of Lübeck, which would become his flagship. Hawkins would then attack native towns in Africa, selling their inhabitants to Spanish ports in the Caribbean mainland to make a large profit for him, the queen, and investors in her court who invested in him and his voyages. Based on this association, several scholars list Drake as one of the first English slave traders in history. Starting off strong, Drake. Starting off strong. Unfortunately, the Portuguese and Spanish were none too happy about the English entering into the slave trade and selling slaves to their colonies because the Spanish and Portuguese said that this was illegal. You could not sell, you could not take their slaves and sell them to their colonies. That was usurping the chain of, chain of commerce. And so Queen Elizabeth, bowing under pressure in, in order to avoid an armed conflict at the time, would forbid a third slaving voyage. And as a response, he would have one of his relatives do it in 1566, unfortunately being unsuccessful with no payment being received for the slaves. You mean fortunately? Yes. Freudian slip there, Seki. I mean... Well, unfortunate for him. You know, actually quite fortunate for the slaves, considering they were released. I'm not altogether on, I'm not wrong there. The slaves were released and he, and he didn't make any money. I don't know, I feel like the fortunately for the slaves really outweighs the unfortunately for him. Look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Moving Whatever. on. Yeah. So in 1567, we do uh, scholars do believe that Drake did accompany Hawkins on their last voyage, which was a joint voyage. They went to Cape Verde to try to capture slaves around that area, and Hawkins ended up allied with two local kings in Sierra Leone. And the ideal was basically they helped the king, and then war prisoners would be given to them as slaves. And see, here's something interesting about the African slave trade, right? And that's that the African slave trade was not entirely a process of... Spanish, Portuguese, and British, and other nationalities going into Africa, seizing slaves, and then moving them and selling them. By and large, the vast majority of slaves taken onto these slave ships were sold or given to these European traders by 
African groups themselves because they were the war prisoners of intertribal warfare, right? And like tribe to tribe warfare along this sort of slave coast in Africa. So slavery was common in Africa. War prisoners were a thing. And then these people would barter with the Europeans to say, hey, if you give us guns and arms, we will give you these war prisoners so that you can take them away and sell them as slaves, essentially. And this was very, very common, right? So I just want to kind of be very clear here that the slave trade was a work of many nations and peoples, right? And it is a horrible thing that happened. But it did not just happen that Europeans went in, captured people, and then sold them uh, into their own colonies in the Indies and stuff like that. Like, this is a multifaceted process. This is and, a multi-nation involved mistake. Yes. And part of the... And to be fair, though, part of the reason why the Europeans could not go into Africa to seize slaves themselves was things like malaria, right? European ships at this point could not navigate up river into the into the interior of the African subcontinent very easily. That would not be a breakthrough that happened until steamships, right? Shallow, shallow bottom steamships could stay out these rivers, first of all. And second of all, Europeans are very, very susceptible to most of the fevers and diseases that are passed in sub-Saharan Africa. They have no immunity towards it. So until the invention of quinine, which the British fed to some of their troops in India to keep keep them healthy, there was not really a way that these Europeans could go into sub-Saharan Africa without being very, very vulnerable to a lot of diseases and viruses that had developed in sub-Saharan Africa and had not been transferred out of sub-Saharan Africa. So to be clear, it is not that the Europeans did not want to go into the interior of Africa to see slaves themselves, because I'm certain that for profit's sake, it really would have cut out a really important middleman there, because you have to think this is an economic venture, right? It's just that they literally could not without risking more of their men than they were willing to spend, right? And so quinine and steamships really limited European progress into the interior of Africa until the 18 and 1900s. So through the 15 and 1600s, they were re pretty much relegated to making slave out like slave trading outposts along the edge of the slave coast in Africa and trading with local groups to get these war prisoners. I'm sure doing it through merchant trade was also a lot involved a lot less armed conflict on the Europeans' part than if they had to go to. The it very much there. did. Like uh, most of their con, instead of having to conflict themselves with the local tribes, all they had to do was to sell them guns and ammunition and cannons and such. And any tribe close to the coast who could take advantage of the idea of guns would automatically have an advantage against tribes further into the interior. So it, it really was just a, a terrible cycle. Um, and interestingly enough, the British were actually the first to denounce slavery and the slave trade. And I believe before anyone, uh, is one of the earliest countries in Europe to ban slave trade and then the English government made it fully legal for their ships, their merchant navy and their navy to seize slave ships and free slaves. And they actively combated slavery in the later years and were instrumental to ending the uh, slave trade in this area. Was this pre or post the colonies declaring uh, secession? Uh, post, I think. I want to say it's like 17 to 1800s. I want to say that. I'm not sure on the exact date, but I know that the British were one of the first and they actively pursued stopping other countries from trading slaves in the waters of the Atlantic. Not to say they're good. I mean, they participated in the slave trade for 100, 150 years, but just a little bit more of an overarching history of the kind of African slave trade, because I feel like this is one of the best places for me to make any clarifications I want to make, because this is really where we're going to get into it. So at this, so I, I mentioned Ally, Hawkins allied himself with two local kings in Sierra Leone who asked for help in exchange for captives they took. Several hundred prisoners were taken, and the king, while the kings kept the larger share of slaves, they did give some over to Hawkins for his slaving ventures. Unfortunately, the fleet faced storms, armed conflict, Spanish hostility, and a hurricane that separated one ship from the rest of the pack, leaving it to return home on its own. So this was not a very successful voyage. The remaining ships were forced into San Juan de Ulua near Veracruz to make repairs. And unfortunately, the newly appointed viceroy of New Spain, Martin Enrique de 
Almanza then arrived with a fleet of his own ships while they were still renegotiating for repair and resupply. Immediately they were attacked in what became known as the Battle of San Juan de Ulua. English defeat was the result of this battle and all but two of the English ships were lost catastrophically. The Spanish launched a fire ship against the Jesus of Lubeck, or the Jesus of Lubeck, the flagship, and the crew of the Minion, another one of the ships, unfortunately in panic, cut the lines securing them, and Hawkins was one of those who jumped from the flagship to the Minion's decks. Okay. I just don't want to pick that up in the background. Uh, let's see. Drake, at this point, was the captain of the Judith. Um, he actually just fled, leaving Hawkins behind. Hawkins would escape on the Minion. They limped back to England, arriving with a crew of just about 15 people left alive. Um, hundreds of English seamen were abandoned in that port, aboard the ships that were sunk. Hawkins then would accuse Drake of desertion and the thievery of treasure accumulated once they arrived back in England, with Drake denying that and saying that he distributed all profits among the crew, believing Hawkins lost when he left. This turned his life in a distinctly different direction. Thereafter, he did not pursue trading and slaving, but dedicated himself to attacking Spanish wherever he found them. It's said that his hostility towards the Spanish was started after this battle and became a main point of his life going forward, as we will see when we get to the conflict with the Spanish Armada. The voyage of 1567 to 69 was his last association with slaving historically, um, although approximately across the four voyages, historians estimate that there are about 1,200 Africans taken across, but almost three times as many were killed in the process. Drake was in his 20s at the time and likely chose not to question anything that his elders or those in charge of the ships he was working on decided and thus does share some culpability for his participation. But it is notable that as a 20 year old man, knowing that slaving was a relatively lucrative thing, decided to turn away from it entirely. I mean, that is interesting because most people would not once they got a taste of the success. And historically, people did not once they got a taste of the success. See, we know just even in the modern day, if you get a taste of success, sometimes people will ride that ship till it sinks. Yep. Crypto. Oh. Francis Drake's first uh, expedition of his own was between 1572 and 1573. And he intended to attack the Isthmus of Pana, Panama, which was the Spanish part of the Terra Firme and part of the... and known as part of the Spanish main. This was the point at which uh, the treasure of Peru of gold and silver were brought ashore to be taken overland to the Caribbean, where ships from Spain could then take it across, uh, take it aboard at the town of Nombre de Dios. He left Plymouth in 1572 with a crew of 73 men in two small vessels, the Pasha and the Swan, to capture Nombre de Dios. His first raid was in 1572, and although he captured the city, he was badly wounded, and when the Spanish arrived, his forces had to retreat without any of the jewels and treasure that they had said they were going to claim. Rather than attempting to sack the city again, he would then raid galleons along the coast, while, the, while his uh, Cimarron, which was a force of enslaved Africans, escaped from their Spanish slave owners, uh, allied with him, looted the trains that transported the gold, silver, and trade goods from Panama City. One of, these men, one of these men was known as Diego, who later became a free man after years of service under Drake. Uh, after his adventures along the Spanish main and his capture of Spanish silver at Nombre de Dios, it may, he was made rich and famous. He encountered a French privateer, uh, Guillaume Le Testu, near Cabo de Cavi, uh, Cativas, um, who was in command of the warship Havre and joined forces with him into a combined fleet. Drake was absolutely determined to intercept the treasure trains at the Campos River, two leagues from Nombre de Dios, and instructed the captains to meet him at the Francisca River on the 3rd of April to carry them off after the raid. They marched through the forest to the trail within a mile of the city while the Cimarrones performed reconnaissance. They surprised the mule convoy the next morning, seizing more than 200,000 pesos worth of treasure. After their attack, they found that they had captured so much silver and gold that they had to bury much of it as it was literally too much for them to carry, making off with what they would, what they could carry, which was a literal fortune in gold. Um, some say that this account is what led to the stories of buried treasure. 
had to hide that gold they couldn't take with them somewhere. I mean, they literally couldn't. Ca- they literally got so much gold, they could not transport it and still be able to get away. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, the French private, the Frenchman, uh, Guillaume Letetstu, was captured and beheaded. Um, so this, the small band left, dragged as much gold and silver as they could, 18 miles across jungle-covered mountains to the raiding boats. And when they got there, the boats were gone. <laughs> and the Spanish were closing in. So Drake rallied his men, buried the treasure on the beach, built a raft... <laughs> and sailed in a swell with four men 12 miles to the two pinnacles. Sounds like a fucking One Piece episode. It really does. When he literally appeared to his men, they were so alarmed because of his bedraggled presence that they feared the worst about the raid. And apparently Drake uh, teased them by looking really downhearted when he appeared and then pulled out a huge chunk of Spanish gold from his clothes saying, Our voyage is made. Then returning to Plymouth. So, I mean, he didn't actually make it out with a whole lot of gold and silver. And not a lot of men, which is fucking hilarious. Um, It was during this expedition that he and his lieutenant, John Oxenham, climbed a very high tree in the central mountains of the Isthmus of Panama and became the first Englishman to set sight on the Pacific Ocean, which mirrored the earlier achievement of uh, Vasco Nunez de Balboa in 1513. Um, His Cimarrones had cut steps into its trunk on which Drake and the leader Pedro ascended to a platform at the top of the tree and who were then joined by Oxenham. And they vowed that when they saw the Pacific Ocean that one day they would sail its waters, which Drake would eventually do as part of his circumnavigation of the globe. Um, When he returned to Plymouth after these raids, the government actually ended up signing a temporary truce with King Philip II of Spain, and so they were unable to officially acknowledge his accomplishment, but he was considered a hero in England and a pirate in Spain. He made out with some of their gold. That's a win. It's like... like, Well, not not even, because you think, he made out with some of their gold and successfully buried the rest of it. They probably never found it, which is hilarious. Like, it's like the Ukraine Russia war horrible, but this reminds me of that fucking animal from the zoo. Like the, <laughs> the raccoon. I think it was a raccoon. Like sometimes those symbolic wins are just that extra bit of petty is kind of amusing. Yeah. So um, he was uh, after this point, he was actually pl- present for um, a pretty interesting event in history. In 1575, he was back in Ireland, right? And he was present for the Rathlin Island Massacre. Uh, So Sir John Norris and Drake, acting on the instructions of the Earl of Essex and Sir Henry Sidney, laid siege to Rathlin Castle on behalf of the government. And despite the fact that the castle surrendered, Norris's troops would slaughter all 200 of the defenders and several hundred civilian women, men, and children of the Clan Macdonald. Drake was given the task during this event of preventing any Gaelic, Irish, or Scottish reinforcements from reaching the island, and the remaining leader of the Gaelic defense of against English power, um, sorely boy MacDonald, was forced to stay on the mainland. Essex would write in his letter to Queen Elizabeth that uh, sorely boy was likely to have run mad for sorrow, tormenting himself for all that he had lost. So I mean, he was still at the, he was still subject to the the English government, and he unfortunately participated in this horrible event. Where the English government was just like, hey, so this is one of the last remaining uh, holdouts of Irish, Gaelic, Scottish power. Um, Norris, your command is to murder them all. And once you've defeated their forces, massacre the women and children. Which, uh, Jesus, I mean, I understand why governments think it necessary, but it's always so brutal to read or hear about just wholesale massacres of either soldiers or civilians left behind. You know what I mean? Like, I I get why governments think it's necessary, right? Like, I understand their rationale behind it, but I don't... At the same time, I don't understand. It's almost unconscionable to me. It's weird, because the the logical answer here is don't go invading other countries. Yeah. And then the second logical answer is, well, don't kill everyone, because that's horrible. But when you have populations that maybe aren't going to accept the being conquering, annexed yeah. and conquered, 
you then have to ask the question, well, what's next? Which is typically It's either going to be massacre. end the bloodline or enslavement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who would say that the, the idea of ending the bloodline is a more merciful one than the idea of enslavement. Mm-hmm. Also, slave insurrections and slave resurrection, uh, you know, so rebellions do occur. And that's something that I'm sure leaders have in mind when contemplating these actions. It, it's just hard to read about, though, because it's, like, it's, it's not a situation that that like you or I would ever be in. No, I would never so want to be in that it's situation. Ho- so like for us standing outside of it, we look at it and we're like, this is horrible. Like, this is an awful action. Like, how could anyone condone this? But, I mean, we're not in that position. And we're not living 500 years ago. And we're not the one who, who's, are, we're not the ones who are thinking, well, what if it's our children next if we leave them alive? Et cetera, et cetera. Like, I understand, like, in theory, I understand what their explained rationale is. That doesn't is, make any of it right. But I don't agree with it, of course. Anyway, so, post this, 1577, Following his success of the Panama Isthmus raid, uh, he undertakes his circumnavigation of the globe. Um, Drake was to take a voyage along the Spanish to the Pacific coast that was organized and financed by private syndicate, including uh, the first Earl of Leicester, John Hawkins, Christopher Hatton, and Drake himself planning for this. Um, This plan had actually been authored by someone else who had received a royal patent for the purpose. Uh, but was then rescinded by Elizabeth I when the other person had learned of the intentions against the Spanish. Um, Elizabeth wanted uh, Elizabeth invested in Drake's voyage to South America at this time, but never issued him a formal commission because just in case he did something against the Spanish, she could say that she didn't condone it. Essentially, that play play both fields, right? Like fund him so that he's beholden to you if he brings back anything, but don't give him a commission because if he does something it's not traced back to you directly then um diego the slave we mentioned before was employed under drake his fluency in spanish would make him a useful interpreter when uh, spaniards and spanish-speaking portuguese were captured he was employed as a servant and paid wages along with the rest of the crew they set sail in 1577 and the fleet was forced to take refuge in cornwall and then returned to Plymouth immediately because of foul weather for repairs. Uh, Drake set sail again in December aboard the Pelican with four other ships and 164 men, eventually adding a sixth ship, formerly the Santa Maria, now called the Mary, that was uh, captured off the coast of Africa near the Cape Verde Islands from the Portuguese. Uh, incidentally, when he captured it, he kidnapped its captain, Nuno de Silva, who had considerable experience navigating South American waters in order to use him to navigate the South American waters. Unfortunately, he was forced to scuttle two ships, uh, the Christopher and the Swan, due to loss of men on the Atlantic crossing, eventually making landfall at Puerto San Julian in what is now Argentina. Uh, Magellan had called here about 50 years earlier and put to death some mutineers. Drake's men actually saw the weathered and bleached skeletons in the Spanish gibbets as they put to land. Following Magellan's example, Drake then tried to execute his own mutineer, Thomas Dougherty. However, you said tried. Tried. Yeah. Sorry. Tried and executed okay. his own mutineer, um, which... It's like, did this is there like some Looney Tunes ass escape going to happen here? No, no. Um, but he was tried aboard ship for treason and witchcraft, and then executed. So I'm a little. Uh, well, so on the voyage, right? He had had several quarrels with Thomas um, Daughtry, and eventually accused him of witchcraft, charging him with mutiny and treason. Um, but Drake claimed to have a commission from the queen to carry out such acts, which he never presented. And remember, Queen Elizabeth did not give him a commission. And that was underneath the authority that he denied Daughtry a trial in England. Also, the main pieces of evidence were brought by the ship's carpenter, who immediately after the trial was promoted to the master of the ship, Marigold. Um, so he, and he had him beheaded. And I think that's maybe interesting because I think he might have just been trying to kind of repeat what Magellan did as sort of like a symbolic thing. 
rather than actually doing something. You know what I mean? Interestingly, a year, a few years later, he became stranded on a reef in the Celebes Sea, and the ship's chaplain suggested that the woes of the voyage were connected to this execution, and he chained him to the cat hatch cover and had him excommunicated. So that's interesting. Um, when, so when they were in, however, when they were in San, San Julian, uh, they discovered that the Mary, the Santa Maria they had captured, had rotting timbers. So they ended up pulling the vessel ashore, stripping it, and abandoning it. And they decided to remain the winter there before attempting the Strait of Magellan the year, a year later. So in fifth, uh, the three remaining ships of the six that he set out, well, five plus one that he set out with, would leave for the Magellan Strait and the south and the tip of South America in 1578 after wintering in San Julian. A few years later, a few weeks later, he would make it to the Pacific, but one of his ships, Marigold, captained by the shipwright who condemned Dotri, was violently destroyed by a storm uh, in the strait, and another, Elizabeth, captained by another man, returned to England because of the horrible storms, leaving only Drake commanding the Pelican. After this passage, the Pelican was pushed south, and dis they discovered an island that Drake then called Elizabeth Island. He had reached a latitude of about 55 degrees south, according to astronomical data along the Chilean coast. And in the Magellan Strait, he and his men engaged in several skirmishes with local indigenous people, becoming the first Europeans to kill indigenous peoples in southern Patagonia. What a... What a thing to have in your name. Uh, during their stay, they also discovered that an infusion made of the bark of the uh, Dimri's Winteri could be used as a remedy against scurvy. Likely because so many people were dying from scurvy. Yeah, look, at least they found one. That is true. Um, I mean, the other solution is just take on board some fruit at each port and eat it. <laughs> Eating fruit? What do you think we are? Uh, so, um... One historian um, credits him with the discovery of the southern end of the Americas and the oceanic space south of it, which is interesting. Um, but he pushed onwards in his lone flagship, now renamed the Golden Hind in, in honor of Sir Christopher Hatton and his coat of arms. The Golden Hind sailed north along the Pacific coast, attacking Spanish ports and pillaging towns. They captured some Spanish ships, and Drake would use their more accurate charts to help him in navigating these waters, reaching the coast of Peru, where he visited the Mocha Island off of what is now Chile, and he and his manservant were seriously in injured by a hostile tribe on the island. Later, he would end up sacking the port of Valparaiso further north and capturing an entire ship full of Chilean wine. Man, the parties were lit that night. Uh, near Lima, he captured a Spanish ship with about 25,000 pesos of Peruvian gold, which amounted to, which amounts to about 7 million in modern standards. And he discovered news of another ship, the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, which was sailing west towards Manila. So the Spanish used Manila as a major trade port because one of the things that the Spanish did was they rather sometimes than tra rather than sailing around the tip of South America they would often sail their boats across the Pacific ending up in the Philippines right and that made the Philippines into a kind of a giant melting pot of people coming from Asia and Europe and from the Americas and trade going both ways through Manila and the Philippines which is why they're really strong um, there are really strong sort of remnants and residuals of Spanish culture in the Philippines, but also of like even like like Asian culture as well, because essentially the Portuguese and the Spanish just facilitated this huge trade that went straight through the city. Like it was one of the major places that traded in um, silver from the Americas, because remember at the time the Qing Empire in China would only accept their dues paid to them in silver from traders so the spanish mined and harvested silver in the americas sent it via manila to china and traded into china using this american silver which is super interesting um a, so he did end up capturing this uh ship um and aboard it he found 80 pounds of gold a golden crucifix jewels 13 chests of silver veils 
and 26 tons of silver. He was very happy about this and showed this by dining with the captured ship's officers and gentlemen passengers, offloading his captives later, giving each one gifts appropriate to their rank and a letter of safe conduct. You guys had such good loot that I stole from you. I have to respect that you had this in the first place. Right? Like, your loot was so good here. You can each have a little bit to keep and a letter of safe passage from me. <laughs> uh, he would continue north along the Chilean coast, raiding Spanish settlements as he went. Um, and here he began to consider how best to return to England. Uh, he had the possibility of sailing back south, returning to the Atlantic Ocean via the Strait of Magellan or Cape Horn, but ruled that out because of the dangerous weather near the strait and Spanish resistance he would encounter all along the coast. This left two routes, continue north up the American coast, and return to the Atlantic by what was at the time the rumored Strait of Anian. And the Strait of Anian was sort of a semi-mythical strait that was documented in 1560 from early modern cartographers who thought that there was a boundary between North America and Asia and you could access a Northwest Passage from the Arctic Ocean to the Pacific. The, so this strait was actually discovered in 1728 and became known as the Bering Strait. But this Strait of Anian, the earlier kind of um, semi-mythical one, actually appears on maps as far south as starting in California. Um, alternatively, his other route was to sail across the Pacific for the East Indies and return to Indi and return to England, completing a circumnavigation of the world. And since we know this is his circumnavigation voyage, we know which one he chose. He didn't go missing looking for a strait that he wasn't going to find. Yeah, he did not go find this strait that was not discovered until 1728. Man went to the Indies. So he headed up to the coast of Palifor California, passing the Baja Peninsula and continuing north. Um, at this point, the this section of the coast had only been explored um, about 30 years before by Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, who sailed for Spain. So in the intent of in avoiding further contact with Spain, because he already had all the gold he needed, he navigated kind of northwest of where Spanish presence was, looking for a discreet place at which they could collect supplies and prepare to journey back to England across to the East Indies. Um, most sources agree that he reached kind of like the 48 degrees north spot before turning back and heading south. Didn't go much further north than that, although some sources disagree and say he did. Um, in 1579, they made the first landfall at what is now South Cove, uh, Cape Arago, which is south of Coos Bay in Oregon, and then would sail southward from there. They found a protective cove where they landed on in what is now Northern California. And while ashore, he claimed this area in Northern California for Queen Elizabeth I, calling it Nova Albion. Yeah, I'm sure not, that never ended up sticking. <laughs> to document and assert his claim, he posted an engraved plate of brass, claiming sovereignty for Elizabeth and every successive English monarch. Um, after several weeks, they prepared. They were kind of prepared for the voyage uh, by, cre by careening their ship, the Golden Hind, to clean and repair the hull. He actually had friendly interactions with the coastal Miwok people, exploring the surrounding land by foot. And on the 23rd of July, they left New Albion um, for the return voyage. However, they did pause for a day to anchor their ship at the Farallon Islands to hunt for sea lions. Gotta take back a souvenir. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So he headed across the Pacific. A, um, a few, took a few months to catch the uh, Malukas, which is a, gift, a group of islands that are now uh, sort of in eastern modern-day Indonesia. Um, it's said that he likely ended up with his ship down in the Magdalena Bay in Lower California and then sailed to the Malukas and the Spice Islands due to the winds and just the current and how long it took him. Um, unfortunately, at this point, Diego had died of his wounds sustained earlier in the voyage. No. Um, and at one point, the Golden Hind almost caught on a reef and became lost. It took three days and they had to dump cargo to get off the reef. Uh, they befriended the Sultan Babula of Ternate in the Malukas and became involved in some intrigues with the Portuguese in that area and ended up making multiple stops on his way toward the tip of Africa, rounding the Cape of Good Hope and reaching Sierra Leone in July of 1580. In 1580, he sailed into Plymouth on September 26th with Drake and 59 crew, as well as a rich cargo of spices and captured Spanish treasure. The Queen's half share of cargo surpassed the rest of the Crown's income for the entire fiscal year across her whole empire. 
Drake was hailed as the first Englishman to circumnavigate the Earth, and it was the second such voyage to arrive with at least one ship intact after the 1520 voyage of Elcano. Elizabeth declared all written accounts were to become queen secrets of the realm, and Drake and the others swore on pain of death to their secrecy, and she wanted to keep his eyes hidden from rival Spain. He presented the queen with a jewel as a commemoration of the navigation. This jewel was taken off the coast of Mexico, and it was made from it was a piece made from enameled gold bearing an African diamond and a ship with an ebony hull. She would give him the Drake jewel, a pendant surrounded by diamonds, rubies, and pearls, um, and one that Drake wore during a during his portrait by um, Gerarts in 1591. On the side of the pendant, there was a portrait of Elizabeth. And on the other, a cameo of double portrait busts of a regal woman and an African male. It's one of the rare uh, surviving jewel, uh, 16th century jewels, and is currently in, the mu in a museum in London. At this point, she also awarded him a, knight a knighthood aboard the Golden Hind in 1581. Um, the dubbing was actually performed by a French diplomat negotiating for Elizabeth to marry Francis, Duke of Anjou, the King of France's brother at the time. By getting the French diplomat involved in it, Elizabeth, uh, politically, smart, smartly of her, gained the implicit political support of the French for his actions taken in his voyages and his future voyages. Smart. After receiving this, uh, Drake uh, adopted the coat of arms of the ancient Devon family of Drake of Ash, which he claimed distant but unspecified kingship, and his motto would become Sic Parvi Magna, which means great achievements from small beginnings. And the hand coming out of the clouds on his um, coat of arms is labeled Auxilio Divino, which means by, div by divine aid. Drake would then undertake a fairly robust political career. He became a member of Parliament um, in the fourth Parliament of Elizabeth I in 1581 for the constituency of Camelford. And although he did not actively participate at this point, he was granted leave of absence for necessity, necessary business in the service of Her Majesty. He was declared the mayor of Plymouth in 1581, installing a compass in the town's hoe and passing, a law passing several laws regulating local trade. Um, he also cons he contracted the construction of a canal to bring water from the River Mavy and to build new grist mills, which he derived substantial profit from. He again became a member of Parliament in 1584 for Bassini of the Fifth Parliament of Elizabeth I. This time he served the duration and was active in issues regarding Navy, fishing, colonization of America, and uh, issues related to Devon. He spent the next time covered by the next two parliamentary terms, engaged in duties and another expedition to Portugal, and then again would become a member of Parliament in 1593 for Plymouth, being active uh, for issues of Plymouth, but also emphasizing defense against the Spanish. Fuck the Spanish. Now, in 1585, war broke out between England and Spain, um, and Elizabeth, through her secretary, uh, Francis Walsingham, ordered Drake to lead an attack on the Spanish colonies as a preemptive strike in this war. They left Plymouth in 1585. He had 21 ships with 1,800 soldiers under Christopher Carlyle. He attacked Vigo in Spain, held the place for two weeks for supplies, plundered Santiago in the Cape Verde Islands, then sailed across the Atlantic, sacking the port of San Domingo and capturing Cartagena de Indias in present-day Colombia. In Cartagena... Drake released 100 Turks who were enslaved, and in 1586, when he returned, he attacked the Spanish fort at San Augustine in Spanish Florida, burning the town to the ground. After that, he went on to find Sir Walter Raleigh's settlement much further north at Roanoke. He restocked their supplies and took back with him all of the original colonists before Sir Richard Grenville arrived with supplies and more colonists finally reaching England in July, sailing into Portsmouth, welcomed as England's hero. They just suck. It's like, you train a dog to go kill Spanish people. <laughs> they really did. They really did. <laughs> Sir Francis Drake is one of my favorite people in history at this point in time, because the man had like one goal in life, and he was surprisingly really, really, really good at it. 
Like, he just did not like the Spanish. <laughs> and he was really good at not liking the Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you have to admit. Um, so, because of his actions, um, in order to prevent future versions of this attacks, Philip II would order an invasion of England. <laughs> On 15, in 1587, Drake accepted a new commission with several purposes. He was to disrupt shipping routes, uh, slowing supplies from Italy to Andalusia, to Lisbon, to uh, make trouble for enemy fleets in their home ports, and to capture as many ships laden with Spanish treasure as he possibly could. He was also charged with confronting the Spanish Armada after it sailed for England. When he arrived in Cadiz on the 19th of April, he found the harbor packed with ships and supplies as the armada was readying and waiting for fair wind. In the early hours, he pressed his attack into the inner harbor, inflicting heavy damage. Um, the Spanish only admitted to a loss of 24 ships, but historical accounts say that he could have sunk up to 39. It became known as the singeing of the king's beard and actively delayed the invasion of the Spanish by over a year while they recouped their losses. Over the next month, he continued to patrol the coast between uh, the, the Iberian coast between Lisbon and Cape St. Vincent, destroying and intercepting ships of the Spanish supply lines. He estimated that he captured around probably 25 to 30,000 barrels containing provisions and resulted in about 140,000 pounds of profit in money of the time, keep in mind, for England. Holy shit, this man is just Goblin Slayer for the Spanish. He, oh my god, he fucking is. Um, so in 1588, after being delayed for a year because of his initial attacks, the Spanish Armada finally set sail for England and arrived on the English coast in July near Cornwall. An English fleet set out from Plymouth of 55 ships uh, set out to confront it under the command of Lord Howard Effingham, with Sir Francis Drake serving as vice admiral to this fleet, commanding from the galleon Revenge. As the English fleet pursued the armada up the channel, Drake broke off, captured the disabled galleon Nuestra Señora del Rosario, along with Admiral Pedro de Valdez and most of his crew. This ship was known to be carrying substantial funds to pay the Spanish armada, and Drake's ship had literally been leading the English pursuit by means of a single lantern. By extinguishing this, Drake put the English fleet into disarray overnight. The Duke of Medina Sidonia, um, who was appointed to command the Armada, made his way up the channel towards the French shore in San Martin, his flagship, with the English in pursuit, thinking that if he angered in Calais, they would not molest the Spanish ships in French waters. However, a council of war was held aboard Howard's flagship, the Ark, where Howard, Drake, Seymour, Hawkins, Hawkins again, Martin Frobisher, and a few others decided to launch fire ships at them. In the night, the English launched eight fire ships in the midst of the Armada, forcing its captains to cut their anchors and sail out of Calais into open sea. The next day, they fought off the shoals of the Grave Lines, where they pounded the Spanish ships. Drake's squadron gave the Medina Sidonia's flagship a single broadside and moved on. Um, Frobisher, who was directly behind him, stayed with the San Martin, pouring cannon shot into her flanks. Five ships were lost here at this battle. <sighs> Drake actually would write to his admiral whilst aboard the Revenge about this. Um, the Armada, at this point, having failed in their aim, could not sail via the English Channel back to Spain. The English ships pursued them to prevent any landing, although at this point they were pretty much almost out of shot. Nevertheless, this fleet was forced to sail around the British Isles, encountering storms off the coast of Ireland, limping back to Spanish ports, having lost 63 ships. Um, there is an interesting but likely apocryphal anecdote about Drake that says he was playing a game on Plymouth Ho, and that when he was told the Spanish fleet was approaching, he said he was said to have said that there was plenty of time to finish the game and beat the Spaniards because he was waiting for high tide. You want to hear something said about him in a letter from Gonzalo Gonzalez de Castillo to King Philip? Hmm. 
The people of quality dislike him for having risen so high from such a lowly family. The rest say he was the main cause of wars. In 1589, a year after the failure of the Armada, the English sent their own Armada to attack Spain. Drake and Norris were given three tasks. First, destroy the Spanish Atlantic fleet. <laughs> then, land in Lisbon, Portugal, raise a revolt against King Philip II, install the pretender Dom Antonio, prior of Crato, to the Portuguese throne, and third, take the Azores and establish a permanent base in Spain. Man, they're, good. they're really going for it at this point. In the siege of Coruña, Drake and Norris destroyed a few ships in the harbor, um, but were repelled, and this really delayed them for a whole two weeks where he was forced to forgo hunting the rest of the ships and head on to Lisbon. Norris led his army on a march over the coast to Lisbon, while Drake sailed around the peninsula to join Essex with heavy artillery. Um, he demanded that when Norris arrived, he demanded that Dom Antonio raise provisions, um, or the army would retreat, and Drake, against their agreed plans, anchored his feet in the mouth of the estuary, um, rather than run the risk of sailing past the defended stretches of the Tagus. The anticipated rebellion unfortunately never materialized. The ground campaign was a total failure. And so Norris, with his army and Antonio, would end up re-embarking to make an attempt at capturing the treasure fee. But the weather was not in their favor, so they eventually sailed home. However, Drake was not happy at such a bitter setback and refused to return empty-handed. So when the morale of his troops sunk, he made a stop at the Galician Rias, or coastal inlets, pillaging the defenseless town of Vigo for two days, raising it to the ground. Um... And then he headed back with two of the vessels sailing back to Plymouth, um, but were captured by Captain Diego de Aramburu. So altogether, he did not have a good time. There was a huge failure of lives, and upon his return, his behavior was called into question, and he was charged by England's Privy Council of deliberate failings and mishandling of his command, and he fell out of favor and was not given another command of an expedition until 1595 as a result. See, the first mistake there was telling him to do anything other than fight the Spanish. It really was. Like, any, like you, you don't need to give Drake strategy. Just tell him, <laughs> fight the Spanish, and then someone after to follow in his wake. <laughs> and, like, collect the broken bits. Um, so he continued his seafaring career. Um, in 1595, he failed to conquer the port of Las Palmas and actually had a disastrous campaign in Spanish America, suffered a ton of defeats, unsuccessfully attacking San Juan de Puerto Rico, losing the Battle of San Juan. Um, injured the Spanish gunners from the El Moro Castle during this battle, shot a cannonball straight through his stateroom on his flagship. But he survived! He and his second-in-command at the time, Thomas Baskerville, would capture and burn Nombre de Dios and start an overland crossing of the Isthmus to attack Panama, but were repulsed by the Spaniards who had barricaded the road, and after suffering heavy, heavy casualties, they had to give up. A few weeks later, he died of dysentery, a pretty common disease at the time, especially in the tropics, while off the coast of Portobello, where some Spanish treasure ships were seeking shelter. Following his death, the English fleet would withdraw. Before dying, he asked to be dressed in full armor and was buried at sea in a sealed lead-lined coffin a few miles off the coastline, and it is supposed that his final resting place is near the wrecks of the two British ships Elizabeth and Delight, which were scuttled in the Portobello Bay. Researchers are still trying to locate the, 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 his um, remains. Like, literally, archaeologists are still sending divers down to try to find his coffin and his remains because we kind of know where it is. Oh. <laughs> so I gave you a couple more names here, too. You did. You gave me Elizabeth. Who else? Uh, De Hoot. De Hoot. Yeah. De Hoot yeah. How do you spell that? D A H. Yeah, right? U T. Vis? V I S, right? Uh, y S. Sorry. I fucking. I, it's in my notes and I had to, I had to search it. All right. Um, I didn't know how much you wanted about Elizabeth the first. I don't need much on either of them. I just figured this is our best time to cover both of them. Ah, uh, well, Elizabeth the first was a famed queen of England and Ireland who reigned for a relatively long amount of time from 1558 until her death in 1603. She is the last monarch of the house of Tudor. And let me tell you, I have recently been in a Tudor history kick and I think this is absolutely hilarious. So... Um, War of the Roses, right? 1400s. 
um, the oh god, what's the name? The there was the the Royal House of England. The oh fuck it. The Baratheon. No, 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 because because it became the Tudors. No, not not the Tudors, but it ended up in the. Hang on. Plantagenets. So the Plantagenets, their main line died and there were two cadet lines, the Yorks and the Lancasters. The Yorks and the Lancasters feuded for like, you know, a number of years. And eventually the Tudors came out on top. Right. Um, and so Henry the Tudor and then his son, Henry the Eighth. Right. So Henry the Eighth um, had two daughters. Well, really two children who really survived to adulthood and then continue it on. Right. Mary and Elizabeth. Mary was his daughter by um, Catherine of Aragon, um, and thus his connection to the Spanish throne, while Elizabeth was his daughter by Anne Boleyn, his second wife. Mary and Elizabeth kind of had a, had a very fraught relationship throughout the latter part of their lives, right? Because Elizabeth was Protestant and Mary was extremely Catholic. And so when Mary took the throne as the older sister after the death of Henry and Jane Seymour, the not Jane Seymour, the... Um, Lady Jane Grey, the five days queen, um, and their younger brother who didn't did not did not survive, because um, he he had like two son he had a few sons but they all died like young or not that old or from accidents, um, so Mary took the throne and she became known as Bloody Mary because of her violent persecution of Protestants and her intent to turn England back to Catholicism because she'd been raised Catholic and firmly believed in Catholicism like her mother, Catherine of Aragon, right? And remember, Henry VIII converted to Protestantism because it was the only way he could get a divorce from, you know, uh, Catherine of Aragon and then later Anne Boleyn because the, the church would not allow him to keep divorcing women and remarrying, right? And he just was not satisfied. So Mary became known as the Bloody Queen. And she was eventually, uh, she eventually died, executed, and then Elizabeth I became queen. And Elizabeth I reigned through a period, uh, like a literal, uh, pretty much golden age in Britain, right? Like theater, culture, the arts flourished, Shakespeare was alive during this time, a number of famous uh, figures in, in England were, were working and producing during this time. And Queen Elizabeth is also the first is also called the Virgin Queen because she never married. And like it was said that her virginity was the shield that protected Britain because none had penetrated her. None would penetrate Britain. Like that was the symbolism of her virginity. And no, that's actually a good leg to stand on. Like much like our queen, our land can never be penetrated. But that does mean that she was the death of the Tudor line. Yeah, it does leave the problem of air. <laughs> yeah. Um, interestingly enough, she was actually, um, she was succeeded by James I, who I believe was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and descended from Margaret, who was the sister of Henry Tudor, sent to marry the Scottish king. I think. That sounds right to me, but I could be wrong. <laughs> Anyways, but, uh, so she lived about 1533 to 1603, so she lived a pretty long life, 69, 70 years. Um, I think 69, because her birthday hadn't come yet that year, but, you know, 70 calendar years-ish. Firmly Anglican king, um, and she absolutely believed in sort of this age of discovery and, like, being, being a part of it. Um... Like, this, this is why she, what's the word? This is why she was the patron of so many of these maritime adventurers like Francis Drake and Sir Walter Raleigh, who are famous members of history. Do you need anything else? You got anything on the crackpot theories that she was a man from some famous historical people? Oh, I mean, yeah, there's some of those. I will say there's one thing that you did not give me that I was a little disappointed we wouldn't get into here because we were talking about pirates and Ireland and Queen Elizabeth and we didn't get into Grace O'Malley. And I'm not going to talk about it here because we didn't get into it here, but y'all should look up Grace O'Malley. Granuel, Grace O'Malley. The other person you gave me is uh, Dahut, the princess from Breton legend and the down city of Yeez. So it was interesting you gave me kind of more of a mythological character so much. Mm -hmm. 
but basically it's a 15th century tradition um, and sort of the earliest mentions talk about its king but don't actually mention the daughter right the daughter was first mentioned in a 1680 manuscript uh, Vie de Sanks de la Bretagne Amorique right and that's a that's the shameless de Hout who intends to kill her father steals the key that symbolizes royalty this wickedness causes a storm which floods Yis, the city, and she dies in the destruction. In a lot of the retellings of this sort of semi-mythical story, the city is protected by a dike that stops floods, and King Gradlon is the one possessing the key to the gate. His daughter is wicked and lustful, and she has many lovers whom she murders until the devil himself seduces her. Uh, she then steals the keys during her carousing, and her lover uh, opens up the gate, flooding the city. Um, there's supposedly a saint, either Saint Gwenol or Saint Coratin, waking Gradlon and warning him, and he attempts to flee on horse with Dehut riding behind him, but the water almost overtakes him, and he either throws her off or she falls off, and that allows him to escape to safety. The ruins can be seen and its bells can be heard underwater, and in some versions, she turns into a mermaid who haunts the area and can be heard singing. Some also tell that her mother was like a sorceress or a Valkyrie who died in childbirth. But the first mention of this comes from an 1890s manuscript, the Le Grandes Legendes de France. Um, there's also a story about her having to do with Cornwall. So King Mark of Cornwall was hunting and shot a white doe, which transformed into Ahes, the daughter of Gradlon. So she's also called Ahes, as well as Dahut. Um, and she gave Mark the ears and mane of his horse Morvarch as punishment. This seems to have originated with a 1905 story collection, though, which is much later. Um, Ahes appears in several other Breton folktales, like The Lazy Boy, um, and is sometimes attributed with building roads in Brittany and connected to Carhex or Ker Ahes, the city of Ahes. And she is in the name of an ancient woman who builds roads, therefore. All right, good for me. All right, so you ready for Drake? Uh, oh, I didn't even move over the pages when I was talking about them. Whoops, I'm Fine ready for there. Drake. Go ahead. So, yeah. meet Francis Drake, a writer-class servant that originates back from Fate Extra. I see that. Ah, Fate-isms. So, this week... Oh, Jesus. Even the fun... Normally, normally you don't see them there, but okay. Jesus. So, this time Fate actually has a potential fun reason for her to be gender-bent. Okay. It was never hard confirmed. Uh huh. But take a look at Drake's face. Okay. You see how Drake has scars across her face, right? Yeah. So the fan theory goes that this isn't Francis Drake or is an amalgamation of Drake's exploits, mm -hmm. as well as Queen Elizabeth's. Because oh. Queen Elizabeth was noted to have contracted smallpox at one point in her life. Yes. And as a result, had scars across her face. Yeah. And there are other tales that, sh from probably sexist uh, sources, that Queen Elizabeth was a man in disguise. Yeah. Um, so because of those unjust this. rumors, um, the implication here is that in, f in the implication here, and this is a rumor kind of or a fun fan theory that builds off that, is that uh, this Drake is actually Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. In that later into Drake's life, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, after getting the scars, had to be kept away from the public as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And so Drake and Queen Elizabeth would trade places. So Queen Elizabeth would go and do Drake's uh, rounding of the world, and Drake would stay behind and then knight himself when she got back. <laughs> Jesus. That's an interesting idea. Interesting. So Drake, um, this is never hard confirmed, and it would be a, it's a fascinating fan theory that I, th I thought could be fun if it were true, but fate just hasn't followed up on that ever. Mm -hmm. As far as personality goes, she is greedy, but not downright evil. 
Uh, for her, it seems to be mostly about a sense of freedom, or at least that's how it's been proven to be within FGO. Mm -hmm. uh, she especially seems to value those treasures, which are brilliant, but are fleeting. Mm. Um, they're the ones that deserve the most attention. So that's kind of... Sorry, I'm looking at the uh, Extella costumes. Since we won't see them in the FGO wiki. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, relationships? Yep. Okay. Got a few. All right. Um, let's see. <laughs> Gilgamesh, she's incompatible with the Gilgamesh that symbolizes an inexhaustible treasury. Tamama no Mai, she would also be at odds with Castor as she is the epitome of eternity. All right. Wow, is that the real king of the storm? In my head, I imagined her to be a beast the size of a mountain. Then again, hmm. <laughs> if that's what it takes, maybe being the king of storms wouldn't be so bad. Although, having to have a ghost entourage would be a bit scary. That's the storm king? Hmm. The real deal got quite an expressionless grimace. That's about Artoria Lancer Alter. Artoria Pendragon. Nah, nope, nope. I can't pull off that sort of lovely look. Okay. Beautiful, courageous, and top quality skill to boot. If only I got a sailor like that in my ship, too. About Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed. That's fair. Oh. Ugly, suspicious, and the worst sort of personality to boot. Oi, somebody bring me a rope. I'm hanging one here. Huh. Teach, didn't they call him the last pirate after I died? Of course I'd take notice of him. But then again, look at him. Honestly, I'm relieved. It's good to know that no matter how much time passes, pirates will always be scum. Yeah, I mean, technically, Drake was never a pirate, per se. It's a privateer. It's a pirate with public funding. Mm -hmm. it's still different. Go talk to the Spanish. Huh. Columbus? That's one dangerous servant to let hang around. He's one of my great predecessors. First class merchant. Horrible human being. Of course I like him. He has tons of money, after all. How do you think I should steal it from him? Valid. Valid. Steal everything from him. So her primary means of fighting is with her two flintlock pistols that can unusually be fired rapidly, unlike normal, due to running on mana instead of bullets. Okay. Uh, she is one of few uh, possessors of Pioneer of the Stars, making her extremely flexible as a servant put into different situations. I mean, yeah. I would... So we don't have a ton of other Age of Exploration servants, right? We've got Columbus... Magellan? Um, and a few others, right? A lot of them have kind of been um, included as uh, like little anecdotes or they've appeared in name yeah. only. Yeah, I would wonder if any of the rest of them have Pioneer of the Stars. Because you would think that those who, who like really were pioneers in the Age of Discovery, right, would also have that if she has it. But I don't know if they do. I guess we'll see when we get to them. And then, like, obviously, Drake just excels at uh, commanding ships and their crews. Voyager of the Storm, yeah. Yeah. And Golden Rule, of course, because she's treasure high. Happy. I don't know. Drake seemed to lose as much gold as he found. I mean, he still ended up significantly richer, you know? I mean, he might have lost some of the gold, but he managed to get enough back to... I mean, remember the year when he returned with the spices and silvers worth literally the entire take of England? Yeah. So, Noble Phantasm, a uh, Golden Hind. So, Drake can easily call forth her ship, the Golden Hind. It's shown that through use of mana, she can uh, man all its functions remotely and allow it to float in the air without water. Yep, and I see Golden Wild Hunt. So, Drake is actually in fate credited as being one of the leaders of the Wild Hunt. Oh, one of them. interesting. That's why she had that reaction to uh, Artoria Lancer, who in fate was also one of yeah. fate's Wild Hunt leaders. That makes sense. Um this is her ace in the hole. It summons not just the Golden Hind, but she calls forth an army, a smaller craft that she can also control remotely. She most often uses it to fire all cannons simultaneously to create a destructive uh, area over a wide space. Hmm. I've got her din initial designs here. Hmm. She was blue coated at one point. Uh, yeah, interesting. Illustrated by Arko Wada. That's the, that's the hentai one. A lot of Fate Extra Servants. No, in Fate Grand Order. Oh, and only in Fate Grand Order? In, <laughs> it's uh, Takashi Takeuchi in Extra. Ah. That, no, her, her 
the 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 real bad one is by the hentai artist in Fake Grand Order. Oh, who do you you want to take a look and see who they've done? Homie, so- I know who Arko Wada has done. <laughs> All of these characters. So many characters. I know that name at this point. All right. So you is this one the copyright? No, this is the original Fate Extra. Okay. <laughs> I love the pistols. Yeah, Golden Hind. You know what this kind of has the vibe of? Hmm. Treasure Planet. Oh, the floating ship, like in the middle of the like the stars. Yeah. Fun. And this should be Fate Grand Order. Yep. Shell them away with these sea scum. <laughs> Wonder if she gets a boost when you put her against the Spanish servants in FGO. No, she does. Darn, that would have been so funny because there are a few. I've seen their names. Every time I hear Mada, Mada, my head goes Mada, Mada, the name. Stella Link. This is yeah. the one we're going to have to cut. So we'll see you guys when we get back. Oh, she's in the other art. I love that. Pirate on the Cape of Good Hope. The only way to fight a servant like her is mobs. If you're not a servant yourself. Riding around on the boat. It does look a little treasure islandy, you have to admit. Mm-hmm. It's the floating in air. Hey, look, El Drac. The woman who shot down the sun. That was epic. That was really fucking cool. Yay, an arcade! We're spoiled in arcades today. I know. It's unfortunate because they're in limited supply now. Shut the fuck up. I'm trying to forget that. あんたが新しい雇い主かい私はフランシス・ドレイク。まあ、仲良くやろうじゃないか。たんまりくらい。そう、ファイナイス。<laughs> Oh yeah, fight black Beat the shit out of them. Did that thing not emerge like a flying Dutchman? It did. In fuck it. That looked just like the fight in Pirates of the Caribbean 3 with the the whole armada. Alright, the hoot. Yes, so there's a variation of Drake called Da Hoot. Okay. Um, this was created in Agartha by Scheherazade. You can oh. go ahead and move over if you want. Oh. She uses Drake's spirit origin as a base and uh, just drafts on the, the Phantom of Da Hoot. Oh. The result is the Pirate Princess Da Hoot. Da Hoot oh. is greed personified, or greed personified, and within Agartha was known for taking in captive men 
using them for her needs and pleasure with no care for their safety needs or really any well-being. Maeve! Most often they'd end up dead, usually if she no longer saw the men as adequate. She'd just have them killed. Maeve! Uh, the way she would execute them is to dump them into the waters around East. Good for her. Can you guess how what happens by the end of the by the end of her little arc in that story? She is absolutely destroyed. Um. Well, it's Drake, or not Drake? It's Dahoot. Yeah. In Yeast. <laughs> yes. It ends one way. Yeah. So we aren't shown any explicit NPs. If anything, she recycles the animations of Drake in game because at her core, she's just a palette swap of Drake. Okay. But she does have an ability separate from Drake, which is the ability to create a ton of female pirates of yeast who act hmm. as her familiars and are seemingly fully functional people. Interesting. So yeah, that is the hoot. That's pretty cool. Good for Scheherazade. So yeah, not not too much. Despite being an older and actually kind of a fan favorite servant, there's not that much on her. Yeah, but Drake's kind of cool. Like, like you have to admit, like, even you were getting into the story, you know, of Drake's life. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Like, not to say it's all good or anything, but it's cool. Yeah. I believe Fate does bring up that in Fate, Drake actually rests in Avalon like King Arthur just for being a British hero. Oh. But I don't know that for a fact. I couldn't find the source on that myself. I'm mm. sure one exists. It's probably in the extra series. Mm. Oh, look, a costume. Ah, her arcade craft essence. All right, let's see. Oh, well, that's a fun outfit. Love the twin tails. Yeah, that's her Extella link, which we saw. Oh, she's in here. I knew. I remember. Uh, there. A oh, little whale. A lot of Arco servants. Yeah, we're so close to finishing this. One, two, three, One, four that you haven't seen. Two, three, four. Yeah, so you've just, seen the entire bottom row. Yep, it's just these three and this one on the tiger. Yep, yep. Uh, can can you at least tell me if any of these four are coming this year? I know at least two, if not three of them, are on the schedule. Okay, all right. I There's not really any special extra art down here that I haven't already opened up or looked at, so... All right, Mug Bun Bun. Valentine's chocolate from Tran Francis Drake. Here, it's pretty sweet, but here you go. I hear it's a good idea to give things you like to the people dear to you, so I put a lot of brandy jelly inside. I have had chocolates filled with, like, brandy in them. It's not my favorite thing in the world. I personally... Uh, so I'm, I'm one of those heathens. I don't like pairing chocolate with fruit. And I don't like pairing chocolate with alcohol very much, except in specific circumstances. Like when it's like a dessert alcohol, like like Bailey's or Kahlua, like coffee, like Kahlua, like tiramisu's and stuff like that. So I'm not a huge fan of alcohol and chocolate or fruits and chocolate. I like fruits and cream or fruit and vanilla flavors. And then chocolate is like so rich on its own. I like chocolate with like, like green tea or like vanilla or stuff like that. You know what I mean? Um, with the exception of chocolate oranges. Which are my absolute favorite. Golden Rudder. She was lucky, but she's never seen the face of fortune. As she gazed upon the horizon, the sun, the waves, the stars, and the enemies, she realized that in her days, deprived of joy and romance, she must make a decision. I think even Lady Luck herself won't stay too long like this. Aye, something must be done to show our gratitude. So a golden wheel was added to the ship, like a beautiful flower blooming in the heart of the devil, until the day the ship reaches the Cape of Hope. That's funny, real funny. Pirates have terrible tastes, eh, boss? Say, why don't you get inside this barrel? You like them deep sea explorations, don't ya? All right, anniversary heroines. I know everyone here now. Yes, yes, you do. I officially know everyone in this image. Fate Grand Order USA anniversary special. What? Nothing, you're good. Pirate party. Interesting. Look at that. Pirate party. 
Clad in extravagant clothing, we set forth to a party located far out into the ocean. Dazzling treasures, of course there are tons. The sound of gunshots, of course, I get sick of it every day. Top shelf booze to warm your chest, of course, plenty of that after we win. What, there's not enough beautiful women to pick from? Well, that's because most women ran away when they saw the captain. <laughs> that's funny. Bestia del Sol. I think this is supposed to be sci-fi, Drake. Hmm... Oh, that's what the blue art's from. I like it. Bestia del Sol, Beast of the Soul. When crossing the Sea of Stars, there is something that simply cannot be avoided. Running out of fuel? No. Running out of food? Not that either. Things that are sort of... Things of that sort are really, really honestly trivial. In fact, eating up the sun might even feel like a cakewalk compared to when you run across the most sinister female pirate gang. I do not know who those other two people are. I don't think... But it says Saber Wars, so. Yeah, I don't know for sure who they are. Oh, I know who they are. One of them might be Penthesilia. Oh, that might be her then. Yeah. Is that other it person? It actually doesn't list the other two up there. The other person might be Medea. Oh. Huh. Interesting. All right. Final thing. Oh, okay. So Grand Temple of Time, Solomon. Yeah. yeah. There she is. Yep, yep. By Nightingale. Oh, shit, I forgot Summer Drake. Oh, there's another Drake? But you know who else forgot Summer Drake? Who? Titan Moon. Oh. Yeah. So there isn't a Summer no, Drake. No, there's not. Oh, there should be a Summer Drake. Drake would be perfect for a it's Summer so Servant. It's so weird. She's literally a year one servant. Isn't as a, in like She was credited as an anniversary heroine. No alts. No at alts. all. For Drake. Come on, Titan Moon. I'm insulted. How dare you? <laughs> I love Drake. This is great. Anyways, do you have a hint for our next servant? How obvious should I be? Not very. Make up struggle. We're doing a pirate. <laughs> love that. Good luck with that, guys. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you next time.